And I'm very pleased to be able to introduce uh, Morgan Smith, who is the Chief of Interpretation from San Francisco Maritime, who will talk about the ships and um, the, uh, the mission of the park. So Morgan, are you ready? I am, thank you so much. And uh, thanks for having me and thank you all for your career in federal service. Uh, I was excited to come here. I'm like around my, my tribe, my peeps. So I, I feel good about that. Um, I was just wondering beforehand, I'm gonna turn on the PowerPoint in just a minute, but how many of you have been to San Francisco Maritime National Historical Park? Just wave your hand up. Okay, yeah, good amount of people, great. Well, um, I am going to tell you about the park today, and uh, let me just share my screen here. Start the presentation. All right, is that coming through? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um, so I, you know, have a secret goal of coming here today, uh, and that's to get you to visit the park. And we have comment books at all of our park, at all of uh, the visitor center and museum. And the most common comment that we get is like, this was great, I never knew about it. Or, wow, what a surprise. And so now none of you will have that excuse for those of you who haven't been there. You at least know about it. But um, one thing that's also important to know as we go through the ship and the resources is that um, it is just amazing that all these resources were here. Like wooden ships were never expected to last over 30 years. And all of our resources have been in a maritime environment with salt water, uh, you know, the wind, the sand, and that all wears on those resources. So it's unique circumstances and a lot of luck that all those are here for today. So here's an overview, a sky picture of our park. Gives you a little idea of what it's like. And before I talk about all the resources, um, I just want to talk about uh, the actual park land that um, well, people want a lot of different things when they come to the park and there's a lot to learn, but we're not just that. We're a cool place just to hang out. We have bocce balls. You can go to the beach. You can have a picnic there. The 4th of July fireworks are there. So um, we have a lot of the things of a normal park, plus the views of Alcatraz, Angel Island in the Bay but also we have a unique mission um, to tell the maritime story. So this is our park uh, proper. The park was established in 1988. So it's a fairly new park, but it has a longer history that I'll tell you about that led up to the park founding. The actual mission of the park is to tell the history of seafaring Americans and uh, the nation's Pacific Coast maritime heritage. It does this through interpretive themes, including cultural diversity, maritime technology, oceanic, coastal, and inland trade, and uh, preservation, the work that we do. So it's only 50 acres. It's a small park, but it is huge in its cultural significance. Um, this map gives you an idea of the different components of the park. We have uh, Hyde Street Pier to your right with our five National Historic Landmark ships. At the very end where it says Alma, there's actually a collection of smaller vessels at the dock. We have our visitor center, which also houses the Argonaut Hotel and the Maritime Museum. So that's all the park that's there on the main area. But if you go over the hill, um, this map shows our Maritime Research Center. So our administration and research center is right over the here at low, Lower Fort Mason. Um, and I wanna start with the research center because our collections are like the winds in the sail of a ship. It touches every part of the ship. Our collections are in every building, they're on the pier, they're in the museum, and they really are, are a main part of how we tell our story. Our research center has 6 million items between there and San Leandro. So we have the biggest collection in the National Park Service. The collection runs the gambit from um, large parts of sailing ships, small handcrafted items, photographs, maps, films, videos, oral histories, a, a big variety of different things there. And if you wanna learn more about our collections or a park, um, we have a lecture series that is a mess. 
I don't mean it's chaotic. It's actually called MESS. It's Maritime Education for Students of the Sea. So that has gone virtual now, and it's on the last Thursday of every month. And I'll mention a couple other virtual programs that we have. And if you want to find links to them, they're all on our partner's website, which is the San Francisco Maritime National Park Association. But uh, you can also find information about them on our website as well. So uh, our collection illustrates uh, the big transition from the age of sail to the age of steam. This happened around the turn of the century and a little bit later. It's really the new technology of steam was quicker and more reliable and it really changed the industry. And by the 1950s, the age of sail was over and ships still remain some sailing ships, but they're in various states of decay. And the city was starting to tear down the old maritime establishments and businesses and steamships, even steamships were starting to be put aside for newer technology. And at this time, there was a man, Carl Cordham, who lived in San Francisco. And he was a true man of the waterfront, which is uh, a way to say he was tough, stubborn, and opinionated, the old school maritime way. And Cordham and his contemporaries um, formed the San Francisco Maritime Museum, and it forged a partnership with a state park to collect these items before they were lost forever. And this is really the root of where our collection came from. So the Maritime Museum was there, but then in 1977, 1978, the park collection and the ships became part of Golden Gate National Recreation Area. And then in 1988 is when they were actually formed as San Francisco Maritime National Historical Park. So I'll show you a couple of the collections. Um, this is one of my favorites. This is a scrimshaw. Uh, so it is an elaborate carving. Uh, this is on a jawbone of an orca whale. And scrimshaws really started in the whaling industry. They're on bone or can be uh, on uh, yeah, different bone or teeth or different parts of animals. This one shows a maritime scene. It also shows a horse jumping a fence and a dove on a branch. So a lot of times artists on ships would recreate what they either see in front of them or maybe what they miss from home or some fantasy that takes them away from their life at sea. We have 2,500 pieces of art, art in our um, fine art in our collection, including this picture, San Francisco Fire by William Coulter. It's probably the most well-known of our, of our works. And it's depicting the 1906 earthquake and the fire that happened afterwards. Um, here's one of the photographs. This is of the city of Rio de Janeiro. And so it was a steam powered passenger ship which sailed from San Francisco to various ports in Asia. And on February 22nd, 1901, the vessel sank right outside uh, on a reef right outside the Golden Gate. And of the 220 passengers, only 85 survived. So just a few years ago, this wreck was discovered outside the Golden Gate. And um, our collection, photographs like this is the way that we preserve the story of these people in many different histories. We also have over a hundred small craft vessels and most of them were passed down through time, but this one is actually rebuilt. Um, and it represents from 1960 to 1910, these were the workhorses of the Bay. They fueled the Chinese dried shrimp industry in the Bay. So this ship is called Grace Kwan. And uh, it was built by a team of National Park Service volunteers and staff in 2003 at China Camps. Um, this photograph shows the excavation of one called General Harrison. It's an 1841 ship, but it was discovered in 2001 when they were building a, a building. And so historians came and studied it. They took all the artifacts they could find, and then it's buried again under this 11-story building. So we have wine bottles. We have pieces of pipes and other artifacts that were discovered from this in our collection. And about every, every 10 years or so, uh, this happens. And this map gives you a better idea of how that happened. The blue outline um, is where the water line used to be, and you can see all the hardscape that's been built on top of it. All the little yellow ships are ships that we know are there from the ship records, and the red ones are ones that have been discovered um, in the last 20 or so years. 
And why did this happen? Well, in 1948, it was the news of the gold rush. And, you know, people flooded to the city, 62,000 people from 1949, 1950. And every ship in the country that could float at all loaded up with people to take the cargo here. And when they got here, most of the sailors, they abandoned ship because they, they knew they were going to find gold up in the mountains. And so you had tons of ships. When you looked out at the ports, it was like a forest of mass of all these abandoned ships in areas like Rincon Point. Um, and at this time, uh, you know, you had all these ships here. You needed buildings because there were so many people. So they started to reuse the buildings for things like hotels, um, storage houses. There was even a jail in one. But then in 1951, there was a series of fires, uh, especially a big one that burnt these ships down to the waterline. And uh, at the time, the city also needed deeper ports. So rather than try to dig in deeper water inland, they filled on top of all these ships further out. And after generations, it was forgotten that these ships were either even here until they started um, building really tall buildings in the financial district, and they would run into some underneath the, uh, underneath the ground. And so uh, there are many different parts of our collection that come with things like this. But now we're going to turn our attention to Hyde Street Pier. So this is a picture of the pier and our ships docked there. And really, this is the heart of the park. And it's the main reason that people visit the site or the ships. The pier offers people the sights, smells, and stories of Pacific maritime history. And there's nothing like the smell of fresh pine tar to bring you back 100 years to and originally built in 1922, this served as a ferry dock uh, for many years between San Francisco and Marin, but um, until the Golden Gate was bridged, was built, and uh, they could people could go over the bridge. So the flagship, the probably most known ship we have is Balclutha. It's a 301 foot, three masted, still steel hulled, square rigged ship. The Balclutha was launched in 1866, 1860, 1886, and it played an active role in the development of maritime trade and commerce in the United States. It had three main careers. So the first one was carrying grain from California to England. The second one was a Pacific Coast lumber uh, ship. And then the third one was the Alaska salmon trade. The Balclutha is the last square rigged vessel afloat on the San Francisco Bay and is one of only two um, square rigged vessels that are American owned on the Pacific coast. So a uh, small company that she is within. It took a crew of about 26 men to handle the ship at sea, a uh, very complex rigging on the ship, and a journey could last anywhere from three months if you're doing a one-way trip to three years if you went to many different ports. So it was uh, quite a journey, usually three months out at sea before you hit land. A crew would work in four-hour shifts. So it's four hours on, four hours off, all day long. And it was not an easy job, especially when you're coming up on stormy waters like are shown in the picture. The ship is reeling, and you have to go up and furlough the sails, furrow the sails. So you can see on the top left, um, four people up there working the sails in the storm. But, um, you know, a really moving story about this ship came in the third career. You know, as, as steamships became more popular, sailing ships were put aside. But luckily, Balclutha found another career that served her. In 1903, the Alaskan Packers Association bought Balclutha and renamed her the Star of Alaska to carry men and supplies for the salmon trade in Alaska. Since salmon, canned salmon didn't spoil, you didn't really need a fast ship to get there. And um, contractors served as bosses there um, for many of the laborers. The sailors were using a region, but most of the people that worked in the factory, canning ships, making metal cans were Chinese laborers. The bosses worked in between them and the Alaskan packers, and they often took advantage of these non-English um, speaking laborers in contracts of equal debt peonage, where they would charge them a lot of money and they'd have to work it off. So, they would often skimp on the food for these groups. They would give them low quality gear at a high price. 
Sometimes they would even run away with their money at the end of the season before paying them. So not a good situation. Um, and then an enactment of various laws, anti-immigration laws, Chinese exclusion laws in the late 19th century and early 20th century really stopped this Chinese immigration. Um, and the, the ship still had these laborers, but they moved on to Japanese and Filipino and later African-American laborers that did the same job. So this once forgotten story is now an important part uh, of the story that we tell about the ship at High Street Pier. And if you want to know more about this and some other very interesting stories, we have a podcast we started this year called Better Lives, Bitter Lies about some of the misconceptions of maritime history. After the salmon trade, you might have thought Alclutha would have been scrapped at that point, but she was bought and renamed the Pacific Queen. So this ship was sailed up and down, exhibited as a pirate ship, and eventually landing at Fisherman's Wharf. She also had a role in the 1933 movie, Mutiny on the Bounty with Clark Gable. And in 1954, she was abandoned in Sausalito mudflats and purchased by the San Francisco Maritime Museum for $25,000. So it was only all these uses over time that preserved her and allowed her to be the floating museum she is today. Um, one of my favorite uses of her was the Age of Sail, probably our best known program that our association runs where kids come, they stay overnight, they, you know, each crew has a task they have to do and uh, they solve it by the next day. But I'll tell you, when I go to parties, when I go anywhere around town, I tell people I work at the park, they're usually like, Oh, I was a tall sailor with my kid on that program. So it's a great program to see. So moving on, this is a photo of the CA Fair and it was built in 1895 in Northern California for the E.K. Wood Lumber Company, which is based here in San Francisco. It is a wooden hulled three-masted schooner designed for carrying lumber. It is the last of the sailing schooners on the West Coast lumber trade. Bear could carry over 575,000 board feet of lumber. She carried about half the load below deck. The remaining was strapped on deck, as you can see here in the picture to the left. At $30 a month, the pay was good. Ships, uh, the coastal ships had a reputation for being good feeders with good food and giving you plenty of it. So lumber schooner crews stayed on usually for years, whereas people on ships like the Balclutha often got off of one, after one voyage, they were ready to leave. Like the Balclutha, it was only through multiple uses that the ship survived. Um, Fair found new life in 1912 in the salt salmon trade. And then in 1925, she was again adapted for cod fishing in the Bering Sea. With her final voyage in 1950, Fair entered the history books as the last commercial sailing vessel to operate on the West Coast uh, in the lumber trade. The state of California purchased her in 1957, and after initial restoration, she was brought here to San Francisco and opened to the public in 1963. But as Fair neared the hundredth year, she was disintegrating rapidly, and this photo shows you how the massive timbers and planking were ravaged by rot and really uh, in extreme need of repair. After evaluating the vessel, um, the National Park Service decided that uh, almost a full rebuild, rebuild was needed with using as many traditional uh, materials as possible. So as the vessel was taken apart, um, you know, they had a discard lots of rotten timbers, but they salvaged whatever they could and put it back in the vessel. So you can see the um, top, uh, well, on the right side, the little things that support the roof, the knees, they're actually original lumber as compared to the newer, lighter colored lumber. And some of those are the full knees and some of them are carved out with a stronger reinforcement inside of it. So about 20% is original and 80% has been replaced. And this is the vessel in 2007 when she returned from a major restoration. We've gone to two dry docks since then. 
and reconfigured the masts to the historical way they were done and uh, just came back a month ago with a new deck house. So we're hoping to get that open to the public soon. The air has also been house of some of our most uh, well-known programs. It was the start of the age of sail uh, was in this. And then also our sea shanty program, which is shown here in the picture. Now this program got bigger and we had to move it to another ship. And of course this year it's virtual. So you can see it uh, online on the third Saturday of every month. But uh, traditional musicians now from all over the world on our virtual things, our virtual events will uh, sing at these, these events all the time. So uh, it's really a fun, fun event. Another one of our ships is the Eureka. And Eureka is a wooden hold side wheel paddle steamboat. It's a national historic landmark like all the others. And it's the largest floating wooden ship in the world. It was originally named Ukiah and carried people from San Francisco to Tiburon and later Sausalito. And at night it would carry railway cars. But when automobiles became more common, motorists wanted to drive across the bay but there were no bridges, so it was reconfigured to outfit for cars as well. As a passenger ferry, she carried 2,300 passengers and 120 automobiles at once. And at the time, she was the biggest and fastest double-ended passenger ferry boat in the world at 299 feet long. So here's a, a picture from the deck house. And um, from the waterline up, it was identical on the fore and aft or front and back of the ship. And it was done like that because it was easier to disembark. You didn't have to turn around. You just pulled in and then headed the other way from the other side. But with the completion of the Golden Gate Bridge in 1937, that really signaled the decline of these ferry services. Of course, they've been revived now with, with all the traffic. We are in the need of ferry services again. But at the time, um, Eureka had a few more years carrying railway cars, but eventually was retired. And in 1958, joined the historic fleets on Hyde Street Pier. Uh, I think someone. Zena, you are screen sharing on your iPhone. You need to stop that. Let's try this. Let's see. All right, we're back. Not yet. Not yet. Huh. That's a neat trick, Dinah. How did you do that? How about this? No. That's somebody uh, named Dinah. Dinah's iPhone. I don't know who that is. Dinah is a member from. Uh, Member Dinah, can you okay can you now uh, go ahead, Morgan, and try screen Let's sharing see. again? Okay, you're back in business. All right, okay, so um, this brings us to let me make sure. All right, so Golden Gate Bridge was really the downfall of the fairies. Oh, one thing I wanted to mention though. Some of you might remember the ship as the backdrop to the TV show, Nash Bridges. Mm. All right, Hercules, um, if you think of what is a picturesque American steam tugboat, this is what you think, Hercules. Like the legendary figure it was named after, um, this sh that conquered 11, 12 historic feats. This ship also had to display huge feats of strength in her life. Um, this was proven on her first voyage, which was 14,000 miles towing her sister ship, the Goliath. She was an ocean going tug. She sailed when ships could not find wind. She would tail, sail ships, but she, she tugged all kinds of things from barges to log rafts to large vessels. And the power that she had can be seen here towing one of the caissons for the construction of the Panama Canal, which is much bigger than, than her size. The 151 foot ship is riveted steel construction and still contains her original triple expansion steam engine seen here in the photograph.
1975, Hercule Hercules was taken by the state park uh, founded in 1977. Restoration started by the National Park Service. And a volunteer crew still maintains the engine today as we uh, take her up to steam. And in just a couple weeks, we're going to release a 3D tour that'll, uh, on your phone, it'll augment reality and also give you a 3D image of the ship with, a, with videos and other history. So you can come to our web, website or social media and look for the release of that. So this brings us down to a, a couple of our facilities. And this one was originally built in 1907. And it is the canning operation for the Del Monte served for 30 years at that function. And it was the largest canning location in the US for most of that time. When Del Monte closed in 1937, it was used as a warehouse for smaller businesses. And then in 1960, an investor purchased it and transformed it into the retail and restaurant space that it is today. The corner of the building houses the Park Visitor Center and a really great immersive exhibit called A Walk Through the Waterfront, which is literally a walk through history. The exhibit takes you on a stroll through San Francisco's waterfront from early days in the Loney tribes to the 20th century industrialization. And then you might be saying, why are you showing me a picture of the Caribbean and this great beach? But it's not the Caribbean. This is right here, uh, easy for you to get to uh, in the corner of the park in a protected cove, the aquatic park cove. So the idea of an aquatic park had been around for a long time, since the Civil War. Frederick Law Olmsted first designed uh, a layout for it in 18, 1866. In 1905, um, you know, and that faded, but in 1905, the project got new life when an urban planner also suggested a shoreline park there. But um, the 1906 earthquake disrupted this plan again. The cove actually became a dump site for 15,000 truckloads of red brick rubble from the Palace Hotel. But it's actually this landfill that provided the structure of what the beach looks like today. 1909, 1917, there was also interest that uh, you know, faded away for different difficulties like raising the money. But at the start of the depression in 1931, the city was able to build one park, which is Municipal Pier, the curved pier you see at the bottom of the screen. Um, but in 1933, with the depths of the depression, the dream of a public beach once again faded away. Depression, which was, uh, you know, stopped the, the construction originally, also became the savior because in 1933, um, a little bit later, the dreams of a public park, uh, well, actually, it was 1935 when the public park um, was redone because of the Works Progress Administration announced it secured $1.2 million in federal funding for the project. So, this was quite a project. The Federal Arts Project, which was like a subdivision of the WPA, got involved, and they hired William Moser III, who was selected as the architect. Now, he was the third generation of one of the greatest architectural dynasties ever seen. Uh, the pioneer wooden building mill that, that was in Aquatic Park was designed by the Swiss-born architect William Moser I, and it was um, one of San Francisco's oldest buildings. That was 1862. And then his father, William Moser II, built Ghirardelli Square and also the cannery building that I was just talking about. So in just this site, you can see in the foreground, the Maritime Museum building built by the third. And then a little building right above that to the right, built by his grandfather. And then the big Ghirardelli Square in the back, built by his father. So all right there in one view. For the art inside, the building is pretty much lined with art inside. Hilaire Heiler was picked to supervise the art of the building. He had a colorful, surrealistic style. Heiler painted the walls with colorful murals and um, that uh, reflected his ones he had painted in Paris at his club um, called the Jockey Club in Paris. And 
had a jockey club. You know, he knew, met all kinds of artists. He uh, hung out with Ernest Hemingway, Scott Fitzgerald, James Joyce, Anise Nin, Henry Miller, Marcel Duchamp, Man Ray, many of the uh, pillars of art at the time. His lobby mural, which is depicted here, um, is of underwater worlds of Atlantis and Mu. Before he painted the lobber, lobby, Tyler first painted the ceiling of the 47 foot round room with 30 colored hues on the ceiling. He renamed the room the Prismatarium, and he wrote that it functions in relation to the world of color like a planetarium does to the heavens above. The novelist Henry Miller wrote of him, Hilaire lives and breathes color. He is color itself, sometimes, He's a veritable aurora borealis. So he brought many of his color theories um, to the color schemes in the building. But just before the art was completed, uh, the city leased the building to uh, some uh, restaurant owners who opened it and called it the Aquatic Park Casino. They installed garish colored furniture and other uh, aspects that Heiler was in full protest of. And in a scathing letter to a supervisor, Heiler, uh, Heiler resigned just days before the, the opening, and he didn't attend the opening. The letter was also published in the paper, so it made quite a stir. But he wasn't the only one. Uh, the sculptor, Benny Bufano, um, did not complete his contracted works. He was contracted for 12 sculptures. Only two remain today. He actually did three, but he removed one a little bit later. Sergeant Johnson, who is one of the only African-American artists in the WPA in California, um, abandoned his 140-foot mosaic that was installed in the room and it remains unfinished today. So this photo is part of the completed portion of that. And Sergeant Johnson was prolific in the Bay Area, and he was one of the first African-American artists working in California to achieve national reputation. And uh, Sergeant Johnson did many different things, not just tile work. He was a painter, a potter, a printmaker, a graphic artist, and a sculptor. And you can see here his reliefs that he did um, at the building entrance. Because the rush to make the opening date for the building, the building was uh, not completed in a number of ways. Um, when it was turned over from the city. The WPA started working on it again a little bit later, but the concessionaires that owned the casino withheld rent because they said the building wasn't done, even though they were actively using it. And after two years of this, they were eventually evicted and the city was charged with mismanagement. And the building really went unused for many years. It was locked up and abandoned. Um, it found some use in 1948 where the San Francisco Senior Center opened. It's the oldest privately run senior center in the country. It's still there today. Um, and in 1951, it really found its main use. The San Francisco Maritime Museum, headed by Carl Fordham, who I mentioned earlier, leased the building and they ran it for a museum until it became part of Golden Gate in 1978. So you can hear, see here part of the massive restoration that was done in the early 2000s. And uh, you know, today we still welcome people in there, but of course, most of what I've been talking about on site is, is our world before a year ago. So things have changed a lot in the last year. We opened Hyde Street Pier in November, and then we had a shutdown, and now we just reopened again uh, this week on Monday. So what's open is Hyde Street Pier and the outside areas of ships. Of course, everything outside, the beach, the cove, municipal pier has all remained open the whole time. Most of our programs have gone virtual with great success. Um, we had a film release for the Maritime Museum building, which should be on our YouTube channel soon, but we did a release of that last week for, with 2,500 viewers on it online. Um, we've done behind the scene tours. We do our, um, our lecture series I talked about. We have the sea shanties, some great podcasts. So uh, I've really changed the way that we interact with the world. 
and the sea shanties. I don't know if you use TikTok. I didn't know too much about it, but sea shanties have become a rage on TikTok. So we have over 2,000 people coming to every one of those programs and singing from all over the world. So I had to look up what TikTok was, but uh, now I know. Now I know. Pretty amazing. So we're waiting. Uh, you know, we can't wait to open up fully. I mean, we'll probably open one more building. It's likely to be the Maritime Museum, but it'll probably take us a month and month and a half to two months, as long as things keep going on the good traje trajectory that we are right now. But um, you know, San Francisco, San Francisco Maritime is a part of the national park. In national parks, they tell the story of our country. They preserve some of our most special places. The resources they have are, are truly treasures. And we are fortunate in this area to have eight National Park Service sites in the Bay Area, great ones you can visit. And you know, this isn't my park, this is your park. This is taxpayers' park, it's yours. It's owned by the people of the country. So I expect you to come down and check out your property. And whenever you're comfortable coming back down, I hope to see you there on the pier. <laughs>